All right, if you'll take your Bibles, open them to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 is where we're going to pick up in our study in the Gospel of Matthew. It says in verse 18, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him. Great multitudes, yeah. Remember right after he had finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount, it says in Romans chapter, I mean in Matthew chapter 8 verse 1, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Great crowds of people. And we see that uh, Jesus healed a man of leprosy. Then he healed a centurion's servant from a great distance away because the centurion had tremendous faith and believed. And then we see that Jesus went into Peter's house and saw Peter's mother-in-law laying upon the bed sick with a fever, perhaps malaria, don't really know. But anyway, nonetheless, the main thing is Jesus touched her hand and she was healed. She got up and started serving them. Well, it says here then, that's where we left off, in verse 18, tells us that great multitudes were still following him. Oh, actually, actually, go back to verse 16 and 17. And there it says that they brought many who were possessed with devils, and he cast out those evil spirits, and he healed people that were sick. And that was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 53, where it said that uh, he would bear our transgressions and he would heal our sicknesses. And, and uh, people brought uh, sick people to him. And the crowd was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But Jesus never wanted a circus-like atmosphere. You know that. I've said that many times. He did not want that. So a lot of times he'd heal someone and then he'd say, go your way and don't tell anyone. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you and I why he would say that. But if you understand, he did not want this circus-like atmosphere of people coming thinking, well, this is a healing show. We can come and, and be healed. And he was coming to preach the gospel and show people the way to salvation, healing it's just something he did from the compassion of his heart. If he saw someone sick. But anyway, great crowds were forming. Great crowds. And so therefore, Jesus said this in verse 19. Or verse 18, rather. I'm sorry. He says that Jesus saw great multitudes about him. He gave commandment then to depart to the other side. That is to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, in the meantime, before they got on the boat, they're getting ready to get on a boat and sail to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is a freshwater lake. They're getting ready to do that, and a certain scribe came to him. He says in verse 19, he identified Jesus as master. We think of master as being someone like a lord. Someone that you are to pay homage to. Someone you are to respect. And certainly it looks as though that's what this scribe is doing. But actually the word master here is a word which means teacher. Perhaps this scribe was in the crowds, one of the crowds that maybe he was there and heard Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount. That's a good possibility. But anyway... The certain scribe came to him and he identified him. He said, teacher, teacher or master. He said, I will follow you where, whithersoever thou goest. Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you lead. I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm sold out to this movement. And I accept what you're doing. Now, Jesus is going to show this man that if you really mean what you're saying, you're going to have to give up some things. You're going to have to make sacrifices. Here's what Jesus told him. He's basically saying that I don't own a home. 
I have nowhere to live. I have nowhere to stay on each night. And I have to depend on people letting me stay in their home and sometimes stay out in the, under the stars. And that's what Jesus did. You know, Jesus stayed at Peter's house perhaps sometimes. Sometimes he stayed at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house there in, in Bethany and other homes of friends. And sometimes he stayed outdoors, he and the disciples. While we saw this morning in my sermon that uh, sometimes he would go when he's in Jerusalem and he'd go to the Mount of Olives and sleep outside. And so, anyway, he said in verse 20, the foxes have holes that they live in. Foxes have holes. The birds of the air, they have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. This is the first time in the Gospels that Jesus called himself the Son of Man. It just simply means man. But then again, in the book of Daniel, there is a chapter and a couple of verses. Can't remember. I think it's Daniel 7, maybe 13 and 14. I'm not sure if anyone wants to look it up. But it is there where Daniel referred to Jesus, the Messiah, to come as the Son of Man. So it's a messianic title too. But he calls himself the Son of Man. He said, and I have nowhere to lay my head. You want to follow me? Then you're going to have to give up some things. You're going to have to be willing to make some sacrifices. Mark 8, 34, there Jesus said, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Got to deny ourselves if we're going to truly follow Jesus. You got to put things in perspective. You got to put him first. And here we're going to find something maybe a, a quite bit odd. In the next two verses, as he continues this narrative, he says in verses 21 and 22, another of his disciples, it's not one of the original 12. You see, again, as I said this morning, a disciple is anyone who follows Jesus, as follows a leader, someone who's a follower or a learner. That's a disciple. And so there were many who were following Jesus, and learning from him. So one such disciple said to him, Lord, I want to go with you too. I want to follow you. But first, suffer me. The word suffer means allow. So he's saying, allow me. Allow me to first go and bury my father. Now, looking at that, we would all naturally, before we look at this next verse, would think certainly. Jesus would be humble, compassionate, loving, and say to this man, sure, go bury your father. It might be that his father had died, and he wanted to fulfill the responsibility of being the eldest son, perhaps, of being the one responsible to bury his father. It might be that his father has been dead for a year, and one of the Jewish customs was that when you buried someone, you put them in that tomb, the whole body, like when Jesus was buried and laid in a tomb. After a year, when the body has gone through its full decomposition and there's nothing but bones left, families oftentimes would go into that tomb and, and gather the bones and put them in a box called a, a yushari, yushari, something like that. I can't remember exactly how to pronounce it. But it's a little box to hold bones in is what it was. You remember the story of Joseph when he died in Egypt. Joseph told his family, I will die in Egypt. And you're going to leave Egypt one day. And when you go uh, into the promised land, I want you to take my bones with you. See, understand, even though Pharaoh wanted to put Joseph in one of those pyramids, no, no, he didn't want that. He wanted to be buried like the Hebrews are buried. And he was, and his whole body was put into one of those tombs. And then after a period of time, there's nothing but bones left. They took his bones and put them in one of those boxes. And when they went to the promised land, they carried his bones with them. So maybe that's what this man 
here has to do. Most Bible scholars don't believe it's either of the two. Most believe that he's saying, I want to bury my father, but my father's still living, so therefore I want to spend his last days on this earth, however many days it might be, if it's a few days, a few weeks, a few months, or a few years. And I want to be with, my, I want to be with him on the day he dies. And so however long it takes, when my dad eventually dies, then Jesus, I will follow you. Well, Jesus, you know, and look at what he said. Let's just look at it. He said in verse 22, follow me. He didn't say, wait. When he calls, he means business. And when he calls, he means for us to go now, not put it off. He doesn't want to hear us say, well, I got some other things to do first, Lord. You're calling me to teach this class but I got some other things I got to take care of first. You want me to go and visit these folks, but I got other things I got to do first, Lord. How dare we tell God to wait on us? We are in no position to do that. And this man wasn't either. He said, Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Now, some people look at this and say, this is one of the most insensitive comments that Jesus ever made. It's not. It's not. We just got to understand it and put it in its perspective and under, realize what he's saying here. When he said, let the dead bury their dead, he's just basically saying, follow me. Don't, don't, do, don't get tied down and bogged down into tradition and into personal desires. Jesus is saying, if you're going to truly be my disciple, you will put me first before anyone and anything. That includes even family. And if we put Jesus first, then we'll love the family as we should. And the natural love will come from us as it ought to. And he's just saying, let the dead bury their dead, saying that uh, if you're going to follow me, among all these others that are following me, everyone else is left behind, and they hear about it, they're not following me, then they probably are lost. They're dead in their sins. Let them hold on to the traditions of life and to the personal things of the world. Let them hold on to that. But you follow me and follow me now. Give your life to me now is what he's saying to the man. Then, as we proceed on, we find the next thing is, and I've titled this message tonight, The Son of a storm, and a herd of swine. We've already looked at the son. He demands us to follow him. And his life uh, and who he is should compel us to follow him. He's Lord. Now we're going to look at the storm. When he was entered into the ship, finally, see, remember he had said in verse 18, let's go to the other side of the lake because they get a big, big crowd. So they get into the ship. There's that little bit of an interruption there of the scribe and the other disciple. Verse 23 says, when he entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest. Now let me tell you, uh, the Sea of Galilee was 686 feet below sea level. And there were mountains that surrounded that freshwater lake. And the cold air would come down from the mountains and meet the warm air from the lake. And when they would collide, it would cause storms. And there would be multitudes of storms on the Sea of Galilee. And these were, a lot of these disciples were very experienced fishermen by trade. And they were used to these storms. That was nothing new to them. But this one was a doozy. This one shook them up. This is a big one. Actually, let me tell you something. This was not like a, a typical storm on the Sea of Galilee. This one, the, the Greek word for tempest here actually means seismos, from which we get our word seismology, which is a study of earthquakes. So this storm was caused by an earthquake at the sea bottom. It caused the, 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 the earth to shake. And the waves were really rough. And it was rocking that boat. And these disciples were terrified. They perhaps had never seen anything so fierce, 
so horrendously rough. And so what happens is, uh, when this tempest arose, it says it was insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but Jesus is asleep, sound asleep, at the bottom of the boat. And they're, they're just dumbfounded. One thing I want you to see there, it shows his humanity and that he needed to sleep. He would get tired. He had been tired. He, he had been ministering, and he's in the boat, and he's going to sleep. Does that show, again, insensitivity? Does it show that Jesus did not care? No, it doesn't show that. It just shows that he knows what's going on, but he's got it. He's got it. And he's got it, he's got it under control. They come and they wake him up and they say, Lord, save us. We're going to perish. We're going to drown in this sea. That's how the people reacted. You know, a lot of times we go through storms in this life. One thing I want to share with you is that we're all in the same boat, sailing the same sea of life, and there are storms that come into our lives, every one of us. It might be the storm of cancer. It might be the storm of a financial crisis. It can be any kind of storm. It might be the storm of losing a loved one. These storms sometimes can be horrendously powerful and frightening. Scary, terrible. They can really shake us to the core. They can. We can be terrified in the midst of some of these storms of life. How do we react? Do we react with fear? Or do we react with trust and faith? He wants us to react with trust and faith. The human part of us, we get afraid, we get scared. But he wants us to react with with faith and trust and and, and Jesus is asleep, and he's, he's at peace. He's calm through it all. He knows what, he's, got it, he's got it under control. And that's the thing we need to realize. No matter what comes into our life, how fearful, how scary, how frightening, how bad it is, our big brother, our Savior, Jesus, has got it under control. Trust him. Just believe. Have faith. It's going to be all right. One way or another, it's going to be all right. We might perish in the midst of that storm in this life. But then we step onto the other side. Hallelujah. And that's much better than anything here. So we don't know the result, the ending result of our storms. But he's got it. He's under control. He was asleep. He was... He was, he was just okay. You know, the disciples came to him, verse 25. They awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you so fearful, ye little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Mark's version of this in Mark 4, 39. He said, Jesus said, Peace, be still. One day... We'll be going through a storm, as we all have gone through storms already many times in our life. And it might be that uh, when we pray and trust him, he'll just say, peace, be still. And the waters of pain and suffering, the winds of difficulty, they'll all calm down. And it'll be all right. Sometimes it will not happen until we breathe our last breath. But then he'll say, peace, be still. And boy, we'll be rejoicing in the presence of God forevermore. See, we're we're winners. We're not losers in any way, any way or form. It's going to be all right. Now, the next thing I want us to look at, that men marveled, it says in verse 27, saying, what matter of man is this? And even the winds and the sea obey him. Now, let us go to verse 28. We're going to look now at the herd of swine. When he was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes. If you have a Bible ribbon marker or a bulletin or something where you can put a bookmark at Mark chapter 5. I want us to look at these two passages, both of them. The the first thing I want you to see is that Mark's version, look at Mark chapter 5, 1 and 2. And Mark 5, 1 and 2 says... He came over to the other side of the sea 
into the country of the Gadarenes. Wait a minute, Gadarenes, that's the first thing we catch. Gadarenes, if you look at verse 28 of Matthew chapter 8, it says Gergesenes. What's the difference? The Gergesenes, that was just a little small village in a larger country called Gadara. So you can call the man a Gergesene, or you can call him a Gadarene, and both are correct. It's kind of like being called a Pelzerite living in America. I just made up that name. But you can say that I'm a Pelzerite and I'm an American, and both of them are correct. So that's it's no big deal. All right, so then let's go and let's look at uh, chapter 8, verse 28 of Matthew. When he was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two men, two, see that number two, two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs. They're in a graveyard. They're demon possessed, exceeding fierce that no man might pass by that way. People were scared to go through the cemetery because of these two demon possessed men, two. Now let's go to Mark, Mark chapter five, one and two. In Mark's version, it says, There came over unto the other side of the sea of the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man. Does that sound like two? It's one, right? A man with an unclean spirit. Why did Mark say one man and Matthew said two? It's no big deal either. It's possible that it was two, and that one was more visible and that he was perhaps more demon-possessed than the other and that Matthew just seemed to notice him more, and, or Mark did. So Mark mentions one, whereas Matthew mentioned two men. Then let's go on back to Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 8. It says in verse 30, there was, there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine, many pigs feeding Now, you know, the Jewish people could not eat a pig. They could not eat sausage or ham or bacon because to them, by law, a pig was an unclean animal. So Israelites would not raise pigs. They could not raise pigs. It's against the law for them. They they couldn't even touch a pig or a pig's dead carcass. They could not. So it says here that uh, they were in the area of the Gergesenes or the Gadarenes. So it's Gentile people. And it's Gentile people that are raising the pigs. They could eat a pig, whereas the Jews could not. And so the devils, they saw this big herd of swine. And Matthew doesn't tell us how many pigs there were. But Mark in Mark chapter 5, verse 13 says, there were 2,000 pigs. 2,000 swine. Think about this. The devils are in two men. And they ask Jesus to let them go into 2,000 pigs. Those men were heavily demon-possessed. Now, it, it says uh, in verse 31 of Matthew 8, the devils besought him, saying... If thou cast us out, suffer or allow us to go into the herd of swine. The devils cannot stand to be uninhabited. If if they're not in a person, they want to be in an animal. But the devils want to be in something. And so he said unto them, go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine went violently down a steep place into the sea, and perished in the waters. Now let's look at Mark's version. Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 3. This man, demon-possessed, said Mark, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and he's a little bit more descriptive of the demon-possessed man, and said that no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and The chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Both men were. 
but Mark just seems to focus in on one particular man. Now, have you ever heard of deviled ham? Deviled ham is a sandwich meat, grounded ham, and what makes it deviled is spices with black pepper and hot sauce. I always thought that till Mike told me, no, the term devil ham came from these pigs being possessed by the devil. <laughs> so thank you, Mike, for always letting me know that. I now know what devil ham is. <laughs> Mike has told me that many times, and I just had to share that tonight. <laughs> but the pigs ran violently down the steep and into the waters, and the pigs perished. But the devils, the demons, did not perish. It's a picture, sort of, of the, the fact that demons will be cast into the abyss in the final, ultimate end, where they'll not torture us ever again anymore. But in the meantime, those demons, they were in the habitation of two men. And then in 2,000 pigs, the pigs drowned. The two men are set free. The two men are healed. They're delivered. And the pigs are drowned. And the two men, I mean the, uh, the devils, no telling where they went from there. But the devils are always roaring about seeking whom they may devour. Then I close with verses 33 and 34. All right, what about the people with the pig business, the Gentiles, the owners, the ones who were raising the pigs? What were they raising them for? Ham, pork chops, bacon, sausage? What were they raising those pigs for? Anyway, they've now lost their business. They can't make any more money. So they're quite upset about this. It says in verse 33, they that kept them fled. They went their ways into the city and they told everything and what was befallen to the, the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city, that means all the leaders and people in the city and the, that area, they came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. They cared more for their pigs than the, than the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And that's the way a lot of people are. In, the, in life. We care more for this world than we do for Jesus. Like uh, the man who wanted to bury his father or the one that uh, maybe would not be willing to give up his home. I don't know. Uh, you know, Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to make some sacrifices. You've got to give up some things and put your priorities in the right order. Put God first. And we also need to realize, too, there will always be storms, and there will always be the devil attacking us. For after all, Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 8, that the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's vicious. He's evil. Let's put Jesus first and live for him, and he'll take care of us. Amen. Let us pray. We come to you.